Hi, welcome back to the Stork Nerd. Today we're going to dive into the Gundam series game, Zionic Front. I've always liked the Gundam series. When I was younger, my first exposure to it was the Gundam Wing. It was a well-animated, pretty sweet-looking show with awesome fighting robots. I, however, always favored the underdogs in those programs, like the Earthsphere Alliance in the Gundam Wing series. Or, <clears throat> when I was exposed to the One Year War later in the original Gundam series, I always favored the Zakus more so than the Gundams. So when I noticed that Zionic Front was coming out, I was pretty quick to play it, because I really enjoyed the notion of being the Zionic underdogs, at least that's how I felt about the story, until diving into it more and discovering that the Zeons were kind of space racists. We are the chosen. We are the superior race of Zeon. But moving beyond that, I always had kind of a fascination with the Zakus, because the Zaku pilots, despite the fact they were outmatched by Gundams, even went in with a notable amount of courage when they face Gundams. We lost two of our Zakus to just one Federation mobile suit. So that was a rather unique feat of animated courage. In similar fashion to the T-34 Soviet tank, the Zakus were kind of a mass-produced weapon that, through pure force of will, allowed them to fight the Federation to a standstill in the one-year war. Although the allegory of the Zaku being like the T-34 isn't quite accurate. It's more like the Japanese Zero, which initially had the edge in the Pacific Theater but through American innovation was eventually defeated by other American aircraft. So, in similar fashion, the Federation developed a Gundam, which was an arguably superior craft, and kind of forced the Zakus out of the picture. In the game Zionic Front, it kind of allows you to revisit a lot of the major conflicts that occurred during the One Year War, and revisit a lot of the battles, like the evacuation of Odessa, or the attack on California base, a number of kind of fun things from the animated series. But the argument in this episode I wanted to field today would be that the notion of fielding giant robots, although not impossible, would present such a logistical pro problem that the very act of funding such a project would possibly bankrupt any nation or planetary government attempting to undertake such a venture. What makes me say this is that with an advanced economy, one unlike what we had during World War II, the method in which highly developed or high-tech military equipment is tested and deployed takes years. The process of assembling an F-22 fighter takes anywhere from six months to a year, considering that parts of it are developed at a time, or assembled at a time, and then they are tested, and then assembled together, and then tested again, and then flight tested. So it's an incredibly advanced process in which these craft go through before they even hit the field or actual flight testing. So a Gundam's assembly would probably have to be even more stringent in what would be required for this vehicle to pass assembly phases or quality assurance. And what I can never stop thinking about when I watch any Gundam series is when you look at the grip on the rifle of a Gundam's rifle or a Zaku's rifle, that large 120 millimeter cannon or phase rifle or whatever it is they particular happen to be using at that moment, I always wonder about that grip and what factory it came from, where it was assembled, this is just me overthinking it, but where it was assembled, the processes that went into it. Because a big part of war is the logistics and supporting your supply network. And half the reason I think the one year war only lasted one year was because the logistics behind supplying a Gundam army are impossible. So they probably ran out of spare parts within the one year ending the war. The grip on a Zaku 120mm machine gun would have to be about 2 meters by 1 meter. And the structural requirements of that grip would have to be intense, considering that the recoil isn't, isn't dispersed the same way it would be in a, in a tank. An M1 Abrams American tank is actually 100, has a 120mm cannon on it. Fires a wide variety of depleted uranium shells or conventional shells. But those when those are fired, the cannon has a recoil system where the barrel will recoil and then the rest of the force will be dispersed into the vehicle. Where in a Zaku rifle like that, the force is put directly back into the grip of the weapon. So I don't necessarily know the operational strengths of Gundanium, or whatever the spun alloy is, but it's certainly magical. I'm not saying mass production of a Gundam would be impossible, but would be damn right unfeasible considering the logistics and technical specs required to assemble one of these. If you go to World War II, and this is a perfect example because it was the probably one of the few moments in history where 100% of American industry was de dedicated to reducing items for the war effort. 
During the height of American production, you had minerals being harvested out of the ground, and then 30 days later, they were entering, entering the assembly line floor as fully fabricated aluminum or steel. 30 days. And then, after that, once they go into the production facility, they go into modular areas where they would be built into parts and then sent to other facilities where they would be assembled into fully finished aircraft. Like the B-29, for example, was 55,000 separate parts that were all eventually assembled, which at the height of production, they were producing one B-29 every hour. A Zaku or Gundam would probably be considerably different than that, considering the computer requirements, flight testing, and whatever power source they happen to be using. And the sheer weight of Gundanium, or whatever the Zaku is, which they say is a steel alloy of some sort, would be incredibly difficult. Even though not impossible, considering machines are incredibly amazing at aiding us and helping us in these productions. But would be incredibly difficult to move. But what always makes me think about that would be the sheer size and requirements of the production facility for even the grip or the fully assembled assembly, assembly plant for a Zaku or Gundam. If you take a look at the B-29 production facilities, these things were the size of small cities. And in certain areas, like namely Seattle or like Portland or Boeing, like where Boeing is pretty popular, this the factories were actually hidden under fake cities. Camouflage to look like a town was on top of them. They were that immense. At which point, these assembly areas could be building tons of planes at the same time. And the B-29's wingspan was about 149 feet. Or 144, depending on if you can do math. But <laughs> if you take your average Zaku, it's only about 18 meters, so roughly 54 feet. I'm probably not... 100% correct on my um, conversion, but about 54 feet, so it's not necessarily too big to produce in an area, but the facility requirements would still be immense. Like many things in mass production, Zaku's would most likely have to be modular, in the sense that parts would be constructed elsewhere, like a knee would be built somewhere, a leg would be built somewhere, an arm would be built somewhere, and then they'd all be sent to a rather large assembly facility where they'd be put together and finally tested and and moved out. The key difference between a World War II economy and a modern high-tech economy when you're building hyper-advanced computer-driven machines like this is that the labor force is entirely different. During World War II you could have unskilled laborers assembling these aircraft because the entire process was designed so unskilled workers could do it. The tools were actually designed so someone with absolutely no experience could master them in a week and become fully functional parts of this assembly process and increase speed after every week when they learn. But with a high-tech process like a Zaku or even the F-22, these things take months to construct. Because even at, if you wanted to push out an F-22 as quickly as possible, it would be about 30 days for one. As opposed to during the height of World War II, it was one B-29 every hour. Here is the wing in a more advanced stage. If the workers imagined for a moment that they were in a shipyard, it would be understandable. Most of parts can be tricky, however. Through massive contracts of the F-22 program, parts of the F-22 are manufactured in every state in America. But even though you had this happening, there wasn't necessarily 100% quality control. Some of the parts would have to be machined when they got to their assembly facilities because they didn't necessarily match specs. So with a Gundam, I would assume modular construction would be still just as difficult, even if they're more advanced. And what always bothered me was the about the One Year War was how much territory the Zionic, Zionic forces captured when they took over the Federation-held Earth. In essence, wouldn't Federation production relatively come to a standstill considering that the Zionic forces had a relative superiority in space and they were t taking over massive parts of uh, the planet? But uh, who knows? One would just assume that if territory was captured, these modular parts would stop being produced and then they wouldn't make it to the ultimately the larger assembly areas. But that's just me nitpicking. It is Universal Century 0079, January 3rd. The Principality of Zeon has declared war against the Earth Federation government. So, in the end, it makes complete sense why the one year war would only last one year. Such an advanced component of weaponry like a Gundam or a Zaku would require an advanced, almost psychotic level of logistic maintenance that I don't think anyone could keep up with. No matter how much effort or funding was put into it, fielding armies with that level of technical equipment would just not be feasible for longer than one year. 